I think we are ready to get started. So super excited to have uh, a couple of experts in the embedded finance space here with us to talk about um, the future of embedded and embedded finance, some of some of the opportunities and challenges in embedded finance, especially um, in in today's day and age. So we're super excited to get into it. This is the future of embedded adapting to the new age of banking as a service. Um, first, let's do some quick introductions. I'll start by just saying hi. My name is uh, Tommy Nicholas. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Alloy. We'll talk a little bit about Alloy at the very end of the webinar. But um, in the meantime, um, I'm going to hand it off to Lauren to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lauren McCullum. I'm the Director of Banking as a Service for Grasshopper. We are a client-first digital bank serving uh, small, medium-sized businesses, startups, uh, and the investors that fuel the innovation economy. Um, I joined Grasshopper shortly after the bank received their charter in 2019. Um, and I came to build this bank uh, in support of our other, um, after I built a couple other uh, startup practices, uh, both at Wells Fargo and Square One Bank. And a fun fact about Grasshopper, uh, it was named after the famed uh, U.S. Navy Rear Admiral Grace Hopper. Um, so we're not bug obsessed, but uh, we're purpose driven. Good to be I here. I didn't realize it was a bit of a play on words. That's yes. uh, that's really cool. And you know, you learn something every day and I know we're gonna learn a lot on this webinar. So we'll hand it over to, to Mark uh, to introduce himself. Hey folks, thanks for uh, thanks for attending today. Good to see you all. Um, I'm the Chief Platform Officer of Treasury Prime. Um, Treasury Prime makes software for banks so that they can build a embedded banking or FinTech business line with direct oversight and relationships with those FinTech and embedded banking clients. Our software is built to give banks the power to build those business units, the FinTech or, or embedded banking business unit on their own terms, choosing the, the partners they want to work with. Um, and I, I will also attempt to, to sling a fun fact about the uh, Treasury Prime name. Uh, Treasury Prime is uh, the first derivative of a company called Standard Treasury, um, which was founded in 2014, uh, I think, maybe it was 2013. Um, and it's the same idea, like helping banks build an embedded banking business line. Um, so it's it's a derivative. So super That's nerdy awesome. math joke. Well, and, uh, and, you know, Chris, the CEO at Treasury Prime has had the unfortunate experience or fortunate experience, depending on how you look at it, of slaving away at embedded finance infrastructure for now, what is it, 13 years? But, yeah, something about like over a decade, years. probably. Yeah. So, um, you know, nobody knows, nobody has more experience embedded within them than the Treasury Prime team. Super excited uh, to have you here to talk about stuff um, as it relates to the entire market. A couple of housekeeping things for everybody here. Drop your questions in the Q&A. The chat should be disabled. So, Sometimes the chat's enabled and q and is enabled and people get confused about where to drop stuff. Just drop it in the Q&A. We are going to try to get to every question that we feel like we can answer. I really encourage people to just fire away and throw the questions into Q&A because we'll triage them and either get to them immediately or at the end, depending on what makes sense. So fire away with your questions in the Q&A. This recording will be uh, uh, emailed to all uh, attendees. So if you feel like there's something that you heard there and you want to point somebody that you work with, uh, to it. It'll be sent to you. And we'll send some additional resources after the webinar. An example is we're, we're going to talk a little bit about Alloy's offering in the embedded finance space, powering um, parent-child risk programs, auditability, and a bunch of stuff around that. But we're going to talk about that at the end, only at a very high level, because we're going to try to get into the actual problem space. Why are there so many things that are challenging about launching embedded finance programs? What is going on in the regulatory environment? That's going to be the bulk of what we talk about here. But there's a, a lot of sort of product capabilities from the various folks involved in the webinar that you might be interested in learning about. We'll try to send more information about those um, as a follow-up. So if you feel like you're going to miss something or want more detail, um, just know that there's there's more coming there. So why, why don't we start with macro trends driving the demand for embedded finance and, and banking as a service? Banking as a service and embedded finance to some extent actually are Synonyms, to some extent, they're not synonyms, um, but you know, I think Mark and Lauren, you all have different perspectives on what's driving 
the demand. We can talk about some of the things up here from the shift to digital. Look, if everything's digital or a lot of things are digital first, how do community banks as all the way through large banks uh, compete for those customers? Revenue diverse, the need for revenue diversification, the you know difficulty of customer acquisition, and then the, the environment is just very, very different than it was in a new number of different ways. But I'd actually love if we could maybe start from the banking perspective, because I think Lauren, maybe you have a, a view into this. What, what's gotten you excited about working on now? This is at least your third FinTech practice. And then maybe as it specifically relates to Grasshopper, what's got Grasshopper leaning in to the FinTech partner space, especially given the fact that you do have a robust direct banking business for startups and, and the business economy? What's got you all um, leaning in? Yeah, I mean, I think we're seeing more people and businesses um, comfortable transacting digitally and as a digitally first bank, digitally native, um, our customers are asking for more products and services to be delivered in a way that they can consume when and where they want to. And their customers or vendors are also aligned in that manner of, can we move money? Can we engage in a way that is digital first, paper processes last, if you will? Um, and we're excited about enabling that. Um, as a digitally native bank and as a bank that likes to partner with technology uh, enablers as well, it lends really nicely to our banking as a service line of business that we have. We have the ability to reach more customers with that. We have the ability to grow our deposits and accelerate our uh, fee income opportunities through expanded partnerships. And uh, we're really enjoying it. Um, we're in our third, third, second full year, third year of running it. Um, and it's been an exceptional uh, growth story and uh, partnership opportunity, both from the FinTech perspective, but our partnerships with folks like uh, you and Mark. Well, and you all have some folks um, at Grasshopper, including, you know, including the CEO, Mike, who have been doing the equivalent of embedded finance or banking as a service as long as roughly anyone has. So yeah. you know, to some extent, that's a trick question of like, why are you in this business? <laughs> well, like if Mike's the CEO, I'm pretty sure that's the business <laughs> you're going to be in, but it also has that is right. a good, a good um, and Mark, yeah. you all, I think you all see now, you see this from a bunch of different angles. Are there different flavors of what drives folks into banking as a service and embedded finance? Are there like specific you know, deposit gaps that people want to fill versus sometimes it just being an extension of their strategy. What are the different flavors of, of what inspires people to go, you know, partner with a treasury prime to stand up a fintech program? Yeah, I think on uh, the reason a bank uh, chooses to work with treasury prime is because they want to build an embedded banking practice to have another channel to gather deposits. I think about embedded banking as another digital, a distinct digital channel that they use to draw, gather deposits, um, to transact digitally um, on those deposits or using those deposits and maybe even to do loans digitally. Um, and instead of happening, um, you know, on, with the bank as the, you um, you know, in the, in quote unquote, in the banks app directly, like in that digitally native Grasshopper Bank app, it's done in a third party app. Um, and Grasshopper is doing it in partnership with that third party, that embedded banking opportunity. Um, and I think we're in, I think we're in like the super early days, relatively speaking, of this shift to embedded banking um, happening at the edges of the banking, at the edges of, of, um, the internet, for lack of a better description, in in apps, in 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 other experiences that are not necessarily directly with the bank. And the analog I like to use in my head is there's been we're in the middle of the third major shift in the distribution of financial products and services by banks. Shift one, I'm going to put my bank on the internet. Shift two, I'm going to put my bank in an app on my phone, mobile. Shift three, embedded. And Treasury Prime wants to work with banks like Grasshopper um, and, you know, pr partners like Alloy to enable that shift to be done safely uh, in with direct oversight in, in meeting their regulatory obligations. 
all the uh, all the cranky old school fintech people would would get on you and say, uh, what well, what about no? There was a shift before that. There was the the shift to actually there being ATMs and and credit card exceptions machines. But, yeah. Uh, you know, I think we're all long since past understanding that portion of the shift. Although I do like to marvel at what life would be like without credit card acceptance and without ATMs, it would certainly be very different. Um, yeah, my description I, is, is definitely a crude razor of the number of shifts. But. Yeah, there's been there's been a, a million shifts, but we're talking about the internet ones. I think one thing that people underestimate, and Mark, I'm actually curious to hear your reaction here, is how often there's a strategic uh, there's a strategic way the bank is operating. One one example I like to think about is imagine you're a bank that's figured out a lot of hyper local and really differentiated ways to lend money. If you have money, you can profitably lend it in a way nobody else can all the way up to some threshold. Obviously, if you got into the hundreds of billions of loans, people would figure out how to compete that away. But you may have some local advantage, relationship advantages, industry knowledge advantages. There's a whole bunch of niches. And it's great that community banks do a particularly amazing job of filling those sorts of gaps. And it's it's I think it's part of why our banking ecosystem is so dynamic. But then maybe you have a deposits problem. To a large extent, uh, these partnerships are about outsourcing the sort of customer acquisition and technology enablement to solve some portion of that problem. Is that what you all see people coming to you sort of initially thinking about? They have some gap in their PL somewhere that they feel like they could more easily solve with technology partnerships than going and spending a lot of marketing dollars. And then they sort of imagine that as a lever that they can pull in a lot of different directions. Is that is that a lot of the impetus or is it more? Uh, I I think that's a reasonably fair characterization. Like the characterization in in my in the way I think about this, I think banks have different ways they can gather deposits um, to power their lending business. Right? Banks buy and sell money effectively, um, and banks have different ways that they can grow their deposit base so they can consequentially grow their their lending base. Um, you could stand up a new branch in your community or in the next town over or in the next city over or a bunch of different branches. You could um, create some new features on your mobile app. Another thing you could do is stand up an embedded banking business line to get another channel of deposits. Um, and we think the only way to do this is directly, like with a direct oversight by banks and of those fintech partners, because that's what creates a very, very sticky deposit relationship. And as we saw, well, as we've seen over the past you know, literally a year, almost to the to the month here, like sticky deposits are very, very, very important. Um, and we believe that, you know, the by enabling banks to do this safely and securely and soundly, you create that another sticky source of deposits. Awesome. Lauren, did that did my description of how folks get into this to any extent resonate with you? Um, anything you would add? Just to take a hard look at getting into this, it's not one that you just jump in and say, I'm going to partner with someone and it's going to be all roses and sunshine. This is a hard business uh, to get done right as we're seeing in the market today. Um, and so, you know, I commend those that are in the market today doing this and you take a hard look before you just dive in. But partnerships um, are the way to do it. Uh, in direct relationship with those fintechs certainly is is what's going to win in the future. Amazing. And I want to get back to a point that Mark just uh, discussed about sticky deposits and the sort of regulatory angles um, that are coming kind of coming at folks. That, but I think that we'll get to that later is a really interesting insight that I want to put a pin in. I'd actually like to ask the, the crowd um, and let's do a quick poll and see what we see what we learn from this. Um, what what factors do you believe are driving the demand for embedded finance and banking as a service in general? Um, you know, pick, be, picking between the um, uh, expansion of financial services into non traditional industries, industries that might have been hard to reach before, uh, increasing the digitization of financial services, basically a way of outsourcing or partnering to do digital transformation instead of doing it fully in house. The potential for revenue diversification, regulatory changes, promoting collaboration in open banking, or in the acceleration of API-driven ecosystems and interoperability effectively, the technology enablement. Um, what factors do you believe are driving the demand? We'll give folks a few more seconds to vote here. 
I think Brandon, you're running the poll. Close it out when you have a good feeling. All right, let's take a look at the results. Can everyone, Mark and Lauren, you can see the, the results popped up here. Okay, great. We can, so yeah. It looks like a pretty strong percentage of people, very strong support for the potential for revenue diversification and new monetization opportunities, not surprising. Um, and, you know, fairly strong support for, uh, you know, expansion, digitization, reaching new industries and uh, the technology, basically technology trends are facilitating this. So therefore it's happening. Not a ton of folks thinking regulatory changes are promoting collaboration in open banking. Um, the folks, I wonder if the folks who selected that one are even potentially in, in Europe or, or aware of, of uh, sort of European regulations. I feel like this is an area that we are behind in, in the United States compared to our European counterparts. I think there's been a lot more um, regulatory push to actually enable this stuff uh, in other countries. And there's been a lot more sort of a laissez-faire attitude in the United States, which which is also to some extent working, but certainly has its challenges. Um, all right, so what do people mean by when they say banking as a service or embedded finance? We thought it would be helpful to just kind of run through a couple of you know disambiguations here. There's really at least three players in the in the ecosystem um, that are specifically targeting banking as a service and embedded finance. There's there's banks. So a lot of people call these sponsor banks. If you're in the European market, they might be banks, but they can also be like, a, I believe that'd be ClearBank as an example, but they may also be um, licensed money service providers uh, with EMI licenses or other similar licenses. So there's a few different ways to go about it. Ultimately, there's a regulated entity that is something like a bank that's gonna be the one that has the direct regulatory relationship. There's technology solutions providers that are providing a variety of different things from you know, processing to deposit holding, count opening, et cetera. Um, that ranges from companies that refer to themselves as BAS companies, companies that are um, pay payments companies, really powering the payment rails um, and card issuers and processors. And then there's the ultimate program. And when we talk about fintechs, we really mean the brand, the company, the program that's going to ultimately deploy financial services in inside of their app. Um, Lauren, what did I get any did I miss anything? Did I get anything wrong there? And then Mark, any uh any comments? Yeah, I think there's a delineation even within the technology solution partners of how and where they play with the support, specifically on the compliance front. Um, but you got it. I mean, it's the provisioning of products and services from a bank through a non-bank financial or third party. Um via APIs. And you do that through a bank partnership. And it's, um, you know, those technology solutions that you're, that are listed there, like Grasshopper, we use more than one, right? Right. We, we leverage a treasury prime for our plumbing, if you will. They're very good at that. Um, you know, we have Marketa on the card issuing and processor side. Uh, we have our core that is also a supporter in the processing side for a different house of banking as a service that we do. Um, you got the networks that are supporting this as well. And then you have ultimately our brands uh, out in market that are the partners that we're working with directly. Um, so there's a lot of layers here, uh, yes. certainly, a lot of layers. and a lot of ways to do it differently, right? Uh, I think we'll get into that a little bit. Yeah, well, actually, speaking of ways to do it differently, one of the things that we find super helpful is disambiguating the different ways to do. Uh, there's almost like levels of autonomy, we call it in the in the fintech and banking as a service market. Um, the first is compliance as a service, which is where the bank or regulated entity is is it's truly like embedding their services inside of your product. They're still doing the servicing, compliance, etc. Um, and then you know that is actually the most straightforward. The issue tends to be, well, the, the bank, the issue can be certainly that, well, the bank is not in the business that, that FinTech or the brand is in for a reason. And it's because there's a lot of different aspects of reaching that customer that are gonna be different and nuanced compared to the core business of the bank. So usually there is some sort of customization that would be helpful from, a, from the whole, setup standpoint and in just strictly embedding the product as is into the in you know into the and fintech would be somewhat challenging and so usually and i think this is something that people forget there there's sort of a level of 
contracting with the partner or the brand to go drive some new technology change that would be helpful to the customer or to the bank to be able to deploy this to be able to deploy this project. And a lot of times when that is required, you either end up in bank as a regulator. Okay, great. Let's do, let's agree on the requirements together on what's going to be done from a AML monitoring, KYC identity verification, fraud prevention standpoint. And then we will help you as an advisor. We'll take on some of those duties and we will also monitor your program and to make sure you're doing it well, but you're ultimately being contracted on the other side. And then there's full program management on the other hand, which is where there's a third party that actually gets involved in managing the program management for maybe potentially many fintechs. Mark, that word program management is a little bit of a loaded term, I think, right it now. Um, yes. Talk to us about that maybe a little bit and how what your views on program management are and maybe the whole embedded finance model. Yep. I'm going to come in hot here. Uh -oh. uh, I know. I don't think program management can work um, safely. I, I do not think that banks can outsource this solution, the, the oversight and regulatory obligations to a third party, full stop. Um, you know, uh, others may have different approaches, but that is my perspective. That's Treasury Prime's perspective. Um, you know, I think compliance as a service is a variant that works. I think bank as regulator is a variant that works. Um, and the, the reason that we think about this is when I think about, um, you know, some of the great fintech brands out there, like somewhere on the prior slide, right? Um, you've got Ramp, you've got um, One, you've got, uh, you know, name some others, Wealthfront, Chime, um, you know, former employer of mine, a firm in the point of sale lending space. They all have one thing in common. They have a direct relationship with a bank or a direct relationship with several banks powering different aspects of their program, right? And that is so that the bank has the appropriate regulatory obligation over oversight of those of those programs, because a bank can only safely work with a small number of new programs a year as they learn to understand the risks um, that are introduced by that new program. And I don't think a bank can safely onboard, let's pick an arbitrary number, 50 fintech programs a year. Like it's just too many. Could you could you do ten? Probably. Grasshopper could do ten. I was gonna say more. Can, gonna can you do ten? <laughs> yeah. We we could do ten. Sure. Varying sizes and at different entry points, right? To give some space to my team who has to do the you know hard work of the diligence. But yeah, ten's reasonable. Fifty? I wouldn't do fifty. Um. What are, some so like, that, what are some of the things that would make it hard to do 50? I think that'd be great for people to really hear. Like what, what's, what's child, what, what, what work we should really go into onboarding a FinTech program and how do you build those relationships and kind of get to get to know them? Yeah. I mean, you have these, as I call them, transparent conversations. Tell me what you're doing. What are your use cases? You really are diving in and diligencing not only the FinTech and their idea, but their go-to-market strategy what their thoughts and philosophy are around the regulatory landscape, your charter specifically, like, will they respect it? Um, is it going to be a win-win-win, right? Are we all going to be able to successfully launch this partnership and, and make money doing it? Are we going to gather deposits in a safe and sound manner? Are we going to have the appropriate fee income for uh, the side of the business that we're looking to grow with them? Um, and, and really just take the time to get to know the company, uh, both, you know, on the surface, the shiny car that they're looking at building, right? Shiny things get a lot of attention, but like fundamentally, how are they building it? And who do they have on the team to um, act as the liaison for the, you know, risk and uh, compliance oversight and monitoring that they as a fintech are going to need to do on our behalf or in partnership with us? We, we span the compliance as a service and bank regulator today. We have a direct Encore model. You can open accounts on our core, you can leverage our KYC, and we are the one making the decision. If that customer of yours is getting onboarded, it's very uh, low level of autonomy as you have it. It's not very flexible, but we can span the other way and allow them to have a little bit more flexibility. It depends on the inherent risks of the program and how we view them. So a lot of time and why we can't onboard 50, we don't have the bandwidth to actually understand these companies at the granular level that we need to, not only at onboarding, but as they grow in scale. Um, 
And I, I also am in Mark's camp of program management where there is a third party doing the compliance on behalf of the bank, uh, offloading our responsibilities. That's that's a full stop no for us. Um, the ABCs of banking is know your customer. And if I don't know who you're onboarding, if I don't have visibility um, into that, th it's not going to be a successful partnership on both sides. You're not going to have uh, sound you know, third party risk management programs where you you know your customers and you know your customer's customer. It's just not going to work. I think we've seen a lot of pressure now coming down. And by the way, this has come down from a few different angles. I think a lot of people point to one thing or another, but if you go read the consent orders that are coming out around these things, and by the way, two disclaimers, like a consent order is not a death sentence. In fact, a lot of the best banking as a service banks that are out there uh, are so good at what they do, partially because they got consent orders um, and they were able to work their way out of them um, and become better and stronger as a result. Like a consent order is the most direct performance review you'll ever get. And a super, super direct performance review is a great way to get better. Um, and so I, th I think, you know, to some extent, these are viewed as like these horrible catast catastrophic things, but they are, they are often learning experiences, but we've seen, we've seen a bunch of consent orders come down. You know, I take a very optimistic approach when it comes to this, which is I've seen a lot of change in the last six months. I think a lot of folks are taking seriously the obligation to go ahead and say, okay, what are the different ways in which the program uh, responsibilities are breaking down and how can we get better? So I see that across the board or where it's not happening. You know, I think there's folks exiting the space. Mark, you've made two mentions or actually Laura, Lauren just made a mention of something, but you made, you sort of referred to it earlier with the sticky deposits thing. Um, and then Lauren, you just mentioned the charter you know, different programs are going to be right for different different banks. Um, and I think there was a point in time where people thought there would be like three or four banking as a service banks. But obviously, Treasury Prime's point of view is that there will be a, a lot of them. And that, that makes sense. Um, how do you all go, A, is am I right about that? Is there Are there going to be a lot of them? And then how do you go and like have conversations with folks about what the strategy that their charter represents means how that's going to relate to them how going and figuring out how they're going to go to market i know these are very complicated topics but how do you all speak to banks about about like what's going to be the right fintech program for them which i know to some extent they have to figure out but i'm sure you talk to them about too yeah i think um i think in, if i were to like paint a broad brush over the banks who have gotten consent orders there's a common thread there um they all tried to do too many programs too fast. Mm -hmm. And that could have been a, a number of, it could be a, the sheer number of programs that they did. It also could be, they grew their deposits too quickly. Like keep in mind for banks, deposits are a liability, right? They have to be able to turn around and hand them to a customer when they come back. That's what creates a run on the bank if too many people come at once. Um, and I think that the regulators are finally aware that like in order to do this business safely, like a bank can only do a small number of these deals a year, right? Like we were talking about earlier. And you you can't outsource building a FinTech business unit line to a third party provider. Um, and so, you know, with, with Treasury Prime, like there are some things we do very deliberately on the infrastructure layer, on the way we integrate to banks that gives banks you like the unique visibility into what's happening on their programs in in my sense this is the only way to do a direct relationship and, and what i mean by this is like every fintech with treasury prime has a dedicated omnibus account in their name or are opening up many encore accounts at a bank um and that is that gives the bank the right oversight and and um uh, ability to monitor for risks and and understand the stickiness of those deposits over time, um, and and I think that's the the only way to do that. And you know, one other thing you asked Tommy is how do you how do you how do you get to identify a bank that that wants to do it right? Like it has to be philosophically aligned, which which Lauren was talking about quite a bit earlier. Like you, you a bank can't short circuit creating this business. It, it, it is a real investment. It requires a dedicated team. Um, and, and it doesn't need to be, you know, a 25 person team. It can be done well with a few people, but it, that inherently constrains your, your bandwidth and your ability to support programs. 
and you get to understand how they think about their community and what communities they want to work with through embedded banking as well. There's so much yeah. that's lost about the community, that word community and community banking, I think to some extent as we digitize, but it still is, yeah. it still is material and it still matters to the charter that folks have been given. For sure. Um, all right. So some of the, we've talked about a lot of the challenges I feel like already, but just to kind of touch on, uh, just to kind of touch on a few of them in a little bit more detail, if you're going to go ahead and be compliant, you've got to ensure that you both have a compliance program, but are also able to adapt that program um, and having the right technology infrastructure, risk management teams in place, and then being able to manage the customer experience that comes out of your risk management program. Those are things that can often be at odds. So if you imagine, hey, we have this compliance requirement, we need to, I always like to use the example of imagine tomorrow a whole bunch of entities get sanctioned and you need to go figure out if all of your different programs are screening for that exact type of sanctioned entity because you change, maybe it wasn't even a type of entity that was within your compliance programs purview before because you considered it low risk, now you consider it high risk. Well, you know, do you have the team technology and then understanding of the customer impact to go implement that tomorrow? I think a lot of folks do, but not everybody does. And I think that's the sort of challenge that that you have. And the, the reason is there's all these players that are involved. You know, there's all these there's all these folks uh, that need to be spoken to. There's the sponsor bank, there's potential program managers, um, there's card issuers. It might, it might even not be exact program managers, but it might even be the technology layer that's effectively doing, you know, doing some of this stuff. There's an oversight and control layer. Then you have multiple programs. Then you have customization of those programs and their rules. And then you have the underlying customers. And so you just see that there's sort of a lot of layers between the bank and the end customer. It's actually not super surprising for the banking industry. And that's been true for a very long time from co-brand card programs to sort of outsource technology, even for the direct business. It, there's always been a lot of different entities involved, but a lot of the entities involved in banking as a service and embedded finance are a little bit new to what's going on here. Maybe haven't been through multiple audit cycles, um, you know, et cetera. And so I think that can be some of the issue, some of, where some of the issues kind of come in. Why don't we ask a quick poll and then we'll react to maybe everything I just said and potentially the poll all in one, which is for those that do work on either a bank or adjacent to a bank, does your bank plan to launch or modify your banking as a service program this year? Um, the choices are, yes, we plan to roll out a banking as a service or embedded finance program. Um, we're, we have one, but we're looking to enhance the BAS framework. Um, we're not going to do that is the third uh, answer, um, or you're currently in an evaluation process. So we'll take maybe 15 seconds to kind of finish that out. All right. Let's see what we've got here. Okay, so 38% of folks say they're planning to roll out a new BAS program. 33% say they're looking to enhance their program. 10% uh, say they're they're not they're, we're not launching anything this year. Um, and 19% say they're in the evaluation phase. That is a really good transition, I think, to the state of fintech in the U.S. Because you would think, given the headlines and the way people are talking about stuff, that nobody is doing anything. And there's nothing happening. There's no no new banking as a service. <laughs> No new embedded finance will exist. In fact, everything that exists will go up in flames. And in fact, I, I do see the opposite. I see a hardening of the ecosystem. I spoke on, on stage um, at, at FinTech Meetup about this. And I feel with, with a few other folks that uh, are either sponsor banks or in the technology business for sponsor banks. And I feel like there's actually like a hardening and an improving of the entire ecosystem and the entire process. And yet, you know, look at the state of venture funding, look at the state of, of you know, of the headlines. Um, Mark, what's going on with the, with the state of fintech, uh, given everything we've just talked about? How do you have so many folks jumping on to learn about this saying, oh yeah, we're going to launch or enhance something that we're doing. We're, we're excited about this while venture funding's at this all-time low, you know, um, headlines are very challenging. Like what, what do you think is going on here? I think um, I think banks operate on a different time horizon than fintechs. 
especially especially earlier stage fintechs, right? Uh, you know, fintechs, time is the enemy, right? Right. You've got to you've got to ship stuff. You've got to get users. You've got to grow, or you die. You don't you don't raise funding, and you know you don't you don't reach your escape velocity, right? Uh, banks kind of have the opposite goal, and and I don't mean they don't want growth, but they want control and understandable growth so that they can manage the risks, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the double edged sword of seeing so many consent orders coming down on, on some of these partner banks who did a ton of deals. Like I think banks understand, okay, I can't jump into this half-heartedly. I have to do it for real. And there's still going to be a lot of fintechs that are founded, but they're going to work with a larger number of banks. Like a, a larger number of banks are yeah. going to become good at doing fintechs over many years. Right. And so I think folks are, are looking at like the next three to five year time horizon and they're like, we want to be a player in this ecosystem as it evolves and matures because there will continue to be opportunity. And this is the way we can think about evolving our bank brand and approach into this embedded banking and finance trend. You know, I remember, and this is part of why the embedded finance trend doesn't just apply to community banks and is starting to apply, and in fact has applied to the larger banks for a long time. We just don't necessarily realize it. Across co-brand, payment processing, treasury services, et cetera, there are fairly mature businesses in some of the larger banks, but they've been primarily targeted at, look, look we already have a bunch of customers for a bunch of different reasons. Oh, they seem to have embedded needs. That is why we should get into this business, which is actually a great reason to get into the business. Yeah. That happens yeah. to apply to Grasshopper as well in a sort of interesting way. Like you all bank, you you bank us. We're, we we put, I think we have money with Grasshopper and very happy to have it there. Um, and so like, you you know, you could, you could bank a, a lot of businesses that might have embedded finance needs. Is that part of the strategy, Lauren? Is that like how it is that like why it's hardened with you all's, um, you know, overall philosophy and strategy? And then the last thing before you answer is we're coming up up upon the part of the webinar where I'm going to talk a little bit about our offering, which I think I'm excited about. I hope other people are too, but um, ask questions in the next few minutes if you've been sitting on them so that we can make sure uh, to ask them for Mark and Lauren uh, before we, we get to some of the things that we're launching together. Yeah, Tommy. So when I look at the state of the U.S. FinTech here, Right, it's it's showing a picture that might not have the entire picture of what's happening in embedded finance. So you mentioned a company may be a client of a bank that has been there as their treasury management customer for many years. And then the next day they're like, hey, we're gonna now offer payment processing for um, the ability of our customers to uh, receive invoices and pay them. Uh, seamlessly. And we're going to build that out. And we're going to now offer that to other businesses that are like us and kind of spin off this software angle that they have. That is happening. And that's not reflected in this funding uh, graph captured here. So it's missing a big part of what's happening outside of fintech that's saying, I'm a fintech, I'm raising money to move money and have a bank partnership. It's these, you know, businesses that are and industries that are now digitizing and moving into the uh, the world of embedded payments and banking as a service partnership. So it's exciting to see what's going to happen. Um, and those uh, those banks like Grasshopper that work with a customer on one side, maybe their direct business, will slowly move them over to their uh, indirect or banking as a service type of environment to support them and continue to grow their relationship. So it's, it's exciting to see, for sure. Percent, hundred percent, and and you've seen that from a, a variety of different angles. Actually, Mark, I think you're a great person to answer a question that we have. We have a couple of questions at a minimum. Um, what what is the difference between embedded finance and banking as a service and why use one term over the other? This is great that you get to answer this question because I don't know the answer to this question. So <laughs> like, I'm excited to learn it as well. I'm sure you thought about it more than I have. Um, I think about banking as a service as a technology layer that enables embedded banking or embedded finance to happen, right? And so banking as a service is a technology layer that sits in between it, a partner bank and their end fintech relationship to make the integration 
to a bank easier. Um, and that's the way I distinguish them. I, I love it. Embedded finance is the business that we're all in, what everyone's in if you're deploying financial services, money moving products inside of other products that aren't specifically banks or regulated entities. Banking as a service is one way to describe the technology that facilitates that. I think that's a clean definition. Um, the other, a couple, some of the other questions we have, actually all of the other questions we have right now, which I'm excited to see, are actually probably better addressed after I get into some of the things that were that we have launched at Alloy because they all address actually deploying the fraud and compliance monitoring and decisioning portion of programs. So why don't we get to our final poll and then get into that stuff? What are your predictions regarding the current state of fintech winter in the U.S.? This is going to be a prolonged period of reduced valuations and funding. Is it going to be a difficult to? Is it simply difficult to say? Um, is it over and we're in a stabilization period or was it overstated and fintechs are thriving or will thrive despite market conditions? Take 15 seconds to get into that. Maybe we'll close. I'm, uh, talking I'm intrigued to see that. the responses. Yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Okay. So everybody punted. They just said it's difficult to say. <laughs> Nobody it's, knows. It's over. It's over. Let's go. Fintechs it's are going to thrive. The answer, it's definitely the answer I would have given. I'd be like, "What do you? Who do you think I am? Like an uh, economic expert uh, here? And even if I were, what what do they know?" Um, so yeah. So I think pretty even support across all the others. But I think people generally say it, it's difficult to say. I think that's completely fair because we don't know what it's going to be like with venture funding being less of a factor in the ecosystem. But at the same time, we're seeing really, really not different businesses than the historical fintech businesses getting into embedded finance. Um, Mark, or, Mark, let's start with you. Any any strong reactions? Yeah, I mean, I, I am. A, nobody can predict the future of the market. Uh, it's impossible. That's kind of how I feel. But, but I believe, I have conviction that if you look over a long period of time, 10 years, fintechs are the thing. Uh, and fintechs will work with many, 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 many great partner banks to build their that product experience. Uh, and when I say fintechs, I mean embedded banking as well, embedded funds. You know, I, I, it's probably been the most, um, it's still, it's probably been the most humbling four years to try to make, be making predictions about what will happen the next year. If you made predictions in 2019 about 2020 and 2020 about 2021, 2021 about 2022. Wrong every started, time. Yeah. We, over, over five, <laughs> right? Like no, over four, over five, no question. Lauren, any other strong reactions from you? I'm also excited about what's to come in the fintech in industry and in general and in large, given the um, given the move that many companies are making, not just specific fintechs, they will all benefit from the growth. So I'm excited. Well, we knew we would all be excited. So we thought we'd end by just saying there is a bull case for fintech. And I actually think for me, from my perspective, one of the bull cases for fintech is addressing actually some of the questions. We have three questions that are about this. Um, which is that the the fintech market kind of knows how it needs to operate now to a large extent, in my opinion. Um, there, the fintech market sort of, I think, really knows that there's going to be regulated entities that are going to have strong technology that allows them to do oversights and oversight and controls of AML fraud, BSA, um, you know, all heavily related concepts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that there's going to be uh, there's going to be a, a pretty narrow set of guardrails for deploying that stuff. And there's going to need to be new technology to facilitate that. And I expect the hardening and the broadening. So the broadening being more banks getting involved and the hardening being it's more clear how to operate these programs. I cannot imagine how that is not going to spark a lot of innovation. If you go back a few years and you think about how hard it was to get a sponsor bank because there were no sponsor banks and they didn't even know how to operate, even if they were even if they were willing to get into the business. And I think all three of us were there when that was happening in various respects. Um, you know, Mark on the fintech side, Lauren launching these programs, and me trying to do the compliance uh, technology for them. Nobody knew 100% what you needed to do, even the most advanced sponsor banks. And so, you know, from my from my standpoint, that is a, a really, really good thing. 
So some quick things on Alloy for embedded finance that I think it would be good for folks to know, like, why am I on this webinar? Why are we on this webinar? Why are we so excited about this space? Well, part of the reason we're so excited about the space is we've been serving this space for, for almost our entire nine plus year history. Um, but another reason that we're excited is that we've spent the last couple of years building hand in hand with some of our with some of our embedded finance technology provider customers to build a new layer to everything Alloy does that's specifically designed for launching and scaling fintech programs from an AML fraud identity and credit perspective without needing to choose between the regulator at uh, the bank as regulator model and the um, compliance as a service model to effectively be able to deliver both of those at any given time or even a mixture of those two. Maybe you are the as a service model for AML controls, but you're the bank as regulator for fraud controls. Alloy can basically make that a seamless, no, uh, no integration required experience. And that's what we've launched. Alloy's job is to make decisions for digital financial services products um, across everything from when they onboard their customers doing the KYC, AML, et cetera, across a large network of third-party partners that are best in class at what they do that you'll select and configure to your needs all the way through helping make decisions about what external accounts can be linked, how account maintenance changes can be made, how to monitor and make decisions about ongoing activity, both from a SAR filing perspective and from a fraud prevention perspective, and then doing automatic step-up intervention along the way. We've been doing this for a long time. We work with both fintech programs directly that are tasked with doing this stuff from either program management or bank as regulator perspective. We work with sponsor banks directly to deploy compliance as a service models. And then we work with large enterprise banks and fintechs across a variety of different verticals to do you know, KYC identity verification, monitoring, et cetera, on their direct programs. The way that we have the product that we now launch that we call Alloy for Embedded Finance is taking all the good stuff we've done around onboarding customers, monitoring customers, et cetera, and adding a layer of control, oversight, and analytics that allows somebody in a sponsor banking or embedded finance business to have one platform where they scale their compliance programs with access to all of the third parties in the market that might want to serve you. Everybody from folks who can do AML checks to fraud checks, to authentication, to every single thing in the market that touches risk. So you don't need to sort of predetermine what it is that you're gonna use for all of these different checks in a way that's built to scale, including when there are many partner programs in the works. The way that ends up looking in practice is you have a low no code, code editor and tool for every type of workflow from onboarding to monitoring that's connected to the entire market of third-party providers. And you'll build workflows that you'll deploy with APIs and SDKs to carry out things like account opening controls, transaction monitoring, et cetera. Instead of that being something that you either outsource from a technology perspective to your fintech to deploy, or something that you do yourself and they have no interaction with because it's sort of behind a black box or whatever the case may be, but instead of being needing to choose between those two things, instead, Alloy can allow you to decide which controls apply to which of your fintechs. Do you deploy fintech? Do you deploy all your fintech programs with a unified sanction monitoring workflow? But fraud controls are something that you audit <laughs> monthly with them uh, via our via shared dashboards between the two companies that we can facilitate. Or do you want to take full control of all, all all onboarding and monitoring controls across fraud compliance, et cetera? That's up to you all because you'll be able to you, sponsor banks and embedded finance providers are going are now able to with Alloy simply choose which of their fintechs are going to get which of these different programs and uh, in one place deploy those changes. We give you a master list of all of your programs across everything that you do, including internal business and all the controls that they've deployed. Um, and then inc and then we'll uh, allow you to customize those over time. If that's something that you're interested in talking more about, we would love to we would love to do that. Um, there were a lot of questions that came in, I think, about this topic. Um, I think I'll try to address a few of them before we go, if that makes sense. Brandon, just tell me if that isn't going to make sense. But I think I'm, I'm, think I'm going to try to do that. Um, the first is, where should the locus of fraud mitigation be between the bank, the technology solutions provider, and the fintech? 
I tried to just address that a little bit because I think it depends significantly. And the reason is the bank is going to have a lot of points of view about fraud that are important. Um, but the fintech is going to know things about A, the technology they can deploy at the front end. Can they deploy behavioral biometrics, document verification, et cetera? There are actual technology limitations to how the channels into which they're launching the products. They may be indirect channels. They may be paper channels. They may be in-person channels. And fraud prevention is heavily dependent on that stuff. That's why fraud prevention has to be a collaboration between the bank and the fintech. And this is why Alloy for Embedded Finance allows a bank to enforce certain levels of fraud controls that cannot be changed while still collaborating with the fintech to make their own decisions about additive controls that might make more sense or may obviate some of the controls on the on the bank side. So that's one thing uh, that I think is uh, important. Um, where are partner banks focusing their partnership? Oh, I lost that question. Where are partner banks focusing their partnership efforts with fintechs, e.g. payments, lending, deposits, and fraud? I would actually toss that out to, to Mark to potentially weigh in on, and then Lauren maybe to say where Grasshopper... Actually, let's start with Lauren. Gra where is Grasshopper focused today um, on your partnership efforts with fintechs across payments, lending, deposits, technology providers like us, like where, what, where, who should contact you and your team if they're uh, interested in working with you all? Yeah, so we stay close to our uh, direct banking enablement. So we work with U.S. businesses serving U.S. customers. Um, most, most use cases are on the end customer being a business as well. Um, that really lends us nicely to be able to work with those customers and share our expertise of working with um, and building a bank to, dedicated to businesses. Um, so focusing focusing there for sure um, is is the best way for us. We are uh, we do deposits, we do you know account opening, um, payment rails, ACH wires, uh, card enablement as well on the debit card side. Uh, we have not gotten into lending as a service. I know that's a really exciting place that a lot of fast providers are going, but we're sticking with what we know uh, and, and keeping it kind of tight with deposits and payments today. Mark, where are you seeing the most heat there? Um, or is it spread across all the different verticals? It's, it's all over the place. Each bank is going to do, you know, what they need to do to serve their their own definition of their community, their niche, right? And that might mean a lending product, that might mean a payment product, it might mean a deposits product, it might mean a mix of these things. And I think it's it, it's different depending on the bank and what they're trying to do. I also like another way I think about this is like that's the type of business that they're building, right? Or the 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 digital channel that they're building, right? Um, but they also enable it more effectively by using software providers too, of their choosing, right? Uh, instead of throwing 10 people at monitoring all these transactions, maybe they can, um, you know, employ a smaller number of folks and use technology like Alloy to monitor their transactions, for example. Um, and this just allows a bank to do things more scalably uh, in, in a digitally modern way. One of the problems we saw in a lot of the consent orders was staffing challenges. And so first was there wasn't a theory when these programs were launched about what it would actually take to operationally support these programs yep. that was backed mm -hmm. up by the revenue yep. they would actually join. That was a huge problem we saw all over the place. Yep. What yep. are specific types of talent that folks really need to kind of get into these businesses that might not be present in traditional treasury services? Like Lauren, you probably know better than anybody. Like, are there specialized? Do you just need somebody who's done it before? What do you need to 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 even think think about this kind of stuff? You need a thoughtful compliance team, really, to start out with the best foundation of building with a compliance mindset. Um, you need the right people and the right roles, right? People maybe who have done it before, who have an experience or expertise um, that can, you know, that ranges from like the technologists that you use to solution uh, the products that you're going to give out to uh, the sales team, right? Having the knowledge and expertise and relationships in market so that you can make your own decisions on what type of fintech you want to let in the door. Um, so people in the right place, product alignment, it is key, right? And making sure that you are able to stick with your strategy, deliver the products and services that you want to monitor those products after you launch them and go slow, right? 
launch these programs in a measured approach so that after you get one live, you can look at it and take learnings from it and apply that to future programs. Um, I, I think Mark shared it before. People get into this and do a lot of programs at once. Like you have to take it slow to, to be effective. Um, yeah, I think those are those are probably the, the ways in which we like to go about it. A question we got, and then I think we'll have to follow up with the rest of these over email, but we definitely will. And I, I thought that was an important one. Um, but this is one of my favorite questions. How is, how is Alloy handling the threat of AI generated deep fake documents? I think the reason that I like to answer that question is because it leads to a broader theme that I want to leave everybody with, which is even when it comes to things like AI generated deep fake documents, it's important to remember that the, the technology already exists and it's already existed for a long time to thwart, A, to generate deep fake documents. Deep fakes are not something that is new from the latest wave of generative AI. There have been really high quality deep fake shops for years and years and years. And second, the technology to stop fraud um, at all levels has existed and is just getting better. There are more technology trends helping fraud fighters than are helping fraudsters. Generative AI is a strong tailwind for fraud perpetrators, but the rise of biometrics, computer, computer vision, the wide, wide availability of data about people and businesses, and Alloy helps a lot with both of those things, KYB and KYC, as well as the ability to do extremely effective and efficient uh, and continuously improving machine learning on top of that data, those are all tailwinds that outstrip the ability for fraudsters to go and um, commit fraud using AI-generated deepfakes. Um, but you know, the, ultimately the issue is, do you have what it takes to actually go and figure out which of those things are need to be delivered in what order? And as things change, can you go ahead and update those things? And if you're a bank, it's hard enough for you to do that. If you're a bank dependent on multiple other technology providers in the form of embedded finance, if you haven't thought ahead about, oh, things are going to change, we may need to deploy a new liveness detection um, uh, check or a behavioral biometrics or analytics program. And then you haven't thought about how you would actually do that. You just let them go live and and said, what we implement now is going to be fine. That's when you'll ultimately be in trouble for anything like generative AI, um, you know, AM, like money laundering gangs getting smart about this, this, or, you know, this or that. And so I think ultimately just thinking in advance about it's not about one particular solution. It's about the ability to deploy solutions efficiently at scale is what really matters. Um, with that, I think we'll get to the rest of these questions um, over over email. Potentially, we will follow up with the recording from this webinar to everybody on the uh, that joined. We will also follow up with a bunch of other information that may be helpful or useful. So thank you all so much for joining, and Mark and Lauren in particular. It's been an awesome conversation, and I really appreciate you guys. Thank you. Of course. All right. Have a good one, everyone.